Thank you, Dietra. I have two goals today. One is to talk to you about these topics. The other is to see if I can get this fly from yesterday. Um, I have a skill at that. <clears throat> um, I want to summarize briefly what the main classes of variables that I want to talk about today that I think have an impact on the knowledge and, and beliefs of the public. But before I do that, I want to make the distinction um, in the terminology that I'm using. When I refer to knowledge, what I mean by that is something that, at least in a socially constructed way, most people, or at least experts, would agree that it is verifiable information. Um, for instance, today we would say the Earth rotating around the sun, knowing that is knowledge. That would not have been knowledge several hundred years ago. The reverse would have been knowledge, OK? So I'm uh, granting that there are some things that we may think we know that will count as knowledge today that actually will not be knowledge at some point in time in the future. By beliefs, what I mean is something that somebody accepts in their own mind as truth, even though we may not be able to verify it, or in fact, we could uh, disprove it with some sort of facts, but what they held, hold inside themselves. So I want to talk about the impact of mass media both on knowledge and on beliefs. And the variables that influence those broadly can be classified as follows. First, ability. Ability can include a number of things, and we might argue about to what extent some of these are abilities, but uh, for classification purposes, things like their level of formal education, their level of prior knowledge or experience with a particular topic, and then sort of absences of constraints um, in terms of time, in terms of distractions. All of these things affect an individual's ability to uh, be influenced by mass communication. Secondly, there is motivation. Uh, we can think of this very broadly. We can think of it as interest in a particular topic. We could think of it as someone's partisanship or their values, uh, the obligations of their employment, and social factors, including demographics, can uh, drive people. They can be motivators. And these motivators can drive exposure to mass communication and can influence someone's processing of mass media information. And as we'll see later, those sorts of things influence the extent to which mass communication can have an influence, sometimes positively, sometimes negatively. Finally, we want to think about the broader information system and the public's access to it. Um, first, there is such a thing as physical access. A few days ago, I was in central West Virginia. I can assure you that many of the people whose homes I drove by did not have internet access. Uh, there's no cell signals. There's, there's, there's uh, the access that someone has, though, is beyond that ability to access the internet. If you can't afford to subscribe to a newspaper, then you may not have access to that, even though the broader information environment may include it. Um, so there is this issue of physical access. There's also the issue of the nature of the media content and forms. And Dominique is going to talk about particularly uh, new communication technologies. But there's a lot of distinctions that we can make. For instance, the inherent nature of way, the way that print media, and by that I literally mean paper, magazines, can convey information through textual uh, signals or signs versus television. Um, or other audiovisual media. There is just fundamental differences in the ways that the human mind can process textual information from audiovisual information. There's also, as Matt has talked about, different ways that different forms of mass media present information, very different information environments across the nature of mass media forms. And then finally, there is an issue, you might call it ubiquity, um, extent of ubiquity, that is, to what extent is the given bit of information saturating the information environment versus available only selectively in some aspects of the information environment? These three classes of variables are the main things I'm going to talk about. Let me put a plug in here for the Pew Center. Um, the, several of the slides that I'm going to put up here now are drawing directly from data available from the Pew Center on their media usage survey, these particular slides. Um, the, the images, that is, are from 2010, the 2010 survey. Um, a terrific publicly available data set to take a look at some of the trends that are happening in mass communication usage. One of the key trends that I think is important, and it's, it's something that we probably all know to some extent, is that there has been a decline in the 
regular use, actually in this case using yesterday, um, of television news, newspapers, and radio news. All of these old forms of communication technology tend to be in decline over the past decade or so. By contrast, online news use is growing. Okay? This should not be a surprise, but it's important to actually have clear statistical uh, evidence of these changes. The other thing that we can draw from this, and it, again, it reflects back on what Matt was just talking about, is that there's a growing uh, tendency for people to engage in partisan selective exposure. So for instance, partisan forms of media have been becoming more popular as what we might have think of as traditional mainstream television media becoming less popular. So for instance, 23% of respondents to the 2010 Pew survey reported regularly using Fox News, whereas the, uh, the highest percentage of respondents reporting regularly using one of the traditional three TV networks was ABC at 14%. And you can see where CNN and MSNBC sit there as well. So there's a, a, an increasing amount of um, partisan selectivity and partisan distinctions in the nature of our news media sources. In addition to partisanship, though, there's also an education differential. Uh, I don't expect you to be able to read that uh, figure from the Pew data. But basically what it shows us is that print news tends to be favored by the more educated, 71% of readers of the Wall Street Journal have a college degree or higher. By contrast, network evening news, only 27% of the regular users have a college degree or higher. So you're seeing a clear distinction across media sources as to who is using them and their potential capacities if we're thinking of capacities as defined by formal education. We also see distinctions in the nature of audiences of different television sources. Um, again, as you might expect, you see that something like CNN has a, oops, there we go. Uh, CNN has a, uh, an audience that is relatively split between liberals, moderates, and conservatives. Uh, Sean Hannity's program is the opposite with most of the audience being conservative. Uh, Keith Olbermann's program, most of the audience being moderates or liberals. Important to recognize, though, that this is not completely uniform. There are liberals and moderates who watch Sean Hannity. There are conservatives who watch Keith Olbermann. That's back when he actually had a show at all, um, not just on MSNBC. Um, so this, this segmenting of the audience is prominent, but it's not perfect, and we need to recognize that. There are also exposure differentials in terms of the young and the old and what new forms of news people are using. Uh, so you can see that most, the heaviest use of a program like The Daily Show for news is among young folks. But you can also see that young folks are actually more likely to read a newspaper than they are to watch The Daily Show, believe it or not. Older folks, 65 plus, they're not watching The Daily Show. They are still reading newspapers. They are the ones who are watching uh, the most local, or I'm sorry, national TV news. So education differentials, age differentials, partisan differentials are one important thing that we have to think about in terms of the selectivity that's being engaged in by the public in terms of their exposure to media information. The news and the information that people get also varies by their source of information. So uh, just citing a few studies here and not getting into the details because it matters very much what context, what science context you're talking about. But we can broadly say that the nature of scientific information is going to vary by the medium of delivery as well as the specific source within that particular medium of delivery. And we've re uh, heard about things like the uh, representation of con consensus in news media, how it varies by media source, how it may be uh, declining or even going away in most sources over time. Uh, Matt talked about that, so did John Krosnick yesterday. But nonetheless, we see science in many ways reflected in traditional media and variations across the sources that cover that. The Collider has not destroyed the Earth yet, apparently. One thing we often leave out, although I was glad to see some of the present presenters yesterday in particular referencing it, uh, 
is the nature of science coverage in entertainment programming. Um, whether we think of that as documentaries that are in some sense sold as entertainment as well as information, or pure entertainment like Hollywood blockbusters like The Day After Tomorrow, um, science programs on television, the Discovery Channel, uh, Mythbusters was mentioned yesterday as a favorite program of a lot of folks, um, or even in pure entertainment programs like CSI, where we see forensic science and maybe most people's access to what forensic science means coming from purely fictional programs like this. So I, what I want to do is run through a number of models, theories that exist in the mass communication literature, talk to you about what little bits of this process they address, and then in the end, I'm going to try to pull it all together for you here. Uh, let's start with the cognitive mediation model for self-serving reasons, maybe. Um, this is very much kind of a, a system two, re referencing back to last night's uh, talk by Professor Kahneman, a system two sort of theory of the influence of mass communication on people's level of knowledge or their uh, beliefs. This model says that people are driven by particular motivations that they have. These motivations influence their exposure, their attention, their cognitive elaboration, uh, like Skip Lupia was referencing yesterday, the connections that they're making in their mind, the associations that they're making, all of these things are influenced by people's motivations and these, motiv or, and these uh, information processing activities and these exposure choices determine the extent to which people will be able to recall information. Whether that information is accurate or inaccurate depends on the nature of the media content to which they expose themselves in the first place. A relatively simple model and assumes relatively rational individuals. This has been ex extended by my colleague Mike Slater, who points out essentially that this model, the cognitive mediation model, fails to consider feedback processes. That is, that media selection and media uh, processing is often determined by the effects of previous media processing, previous learning, pre previous belief formation. And so we can't think of this as a simple linear process but in fact a process of spiraling, of building upon itself uh, over time. The knowledge gap hypothesis, a long-standing hypothesis first developed uh, in the 1960s to try to understand people's beliefs about things like whether or not the United States would actually put someone on the moon as, as Kennedy had advanced, um, suggests that as the nature of the, as the coverage of a particular topic enters the media system. The people with higher levels of education or higher socioeconomic status on the one hand, or others in thinking of what's called a more differences model, the uh, level of motivation or interest, will determine whether or not people uh, learn. And so essentially, as information enters the system, gaps between people with low levels of socioeconomic status or low levels of motivation and those with high levels of motivation actually increase rather than decrease. This theory is kind of depressing for those who actually hope to make positive change with mass communication because what it says is although a rising tide may lift all ships, it lifts better off shifts higher. And so when you try to fix things, you may fix them in, to some extent, you raise all ships but you actually increase the differential between the better off and the worse off ships to start with. Um, more recently, scholars have, have modified this model and referred to something they call the belief gap hypothesis. What this hypothesis says is rather than mass communication attention to an issue, particularly a scientific issue, increasing people's knowledge, factual knowledge in this case, it says increasing mass media attention actually leads to a greater bifurcation between people with different predispositions. So that is in the, in the topic, for instance, of climate change, that before there was lots of news coverage, there wasn't a big difference between what liberals thought about climate change and what conservatives thought about climate change. But with the politicization of that topic and the increasing media coverage of that topic, that's when we saw the divergence begin. So that it was actually media coverage that led to this polarization between conservatives and liberals about climate change. 
Professor Schäufele has advanced a model of differential gains, making the argument that it's not just mass media, that in fact what people often need to make sense of mass communication is an opportunity to interact with those that they know about it, to talk. Uh, you see these two guys here sitting on the dock. I think the guy on the left is saying, I'm going to trade my Mustang in for a Prius because of this whole global warming thing. And the other guy's like, yeah, it's probably a good idea. Buy a refrigerator. And it's, it's a terrific notion that, that the effects of mass communication can be amplified when we have the opportunity to discuss them with like-minded others. But there is also the possibility that we talk to people who we don't agree with who actually may lead to an inhibition of mass media effects on learning because I tune into the news and it says, hey, global warming's happening and humans are responsible and we have to do something to stop it. And I go talk to my friend and he says, oh, it's a bunch of bunk. Turn on Fox News, they'll tell you the real truth. And then I start to question whether, uh, whether Brian Williams was really telling me the truth. Okay, so discussion can either amplify or possibly inhibit mass media effects. And uh, one of my former students and I have also determined that your mix of mass media sources can also amplify or potentially inhibit effects. So for instance, you can think about talking about what's the implications of someone listening to Rush Limbaugh. And we can all have a pretty good idea of what those effects would be. But unfortunately, we rarely consider the fact that somebody who's listening to Rush Limbaugh isn't just listening to Rush Limbaugh. For instance, they may be listening to the other side as well. Now all of a sudden if I say what are the effects on this person who's listening to both the left and the right, you might say something entirely different. And if I add maybe a middle position, you might say something different again. So the idea here is that there are potential synergies. For instance, there are things that we learn really well from print media but not so well from audiovisual. And there are some things that are really well conveyed by audiovisual, maybe not as well by print. In fact, this goes back to some of the discussions yesterday on the most effective modes of instruction in a classroom. It depends on what you're trying to teach someone. And so certain mixes of media forms can amplify effects. Other mixes are either redundant, and so lis listening to CNN, for instance, uh, and ABC, might not be any better than just listening to CNN. But listening to Rutch and listening to Rachel, that might have uh, entirely different effects. Getting back to entertainment for a moment. Um, last night, Professor Kahneman also talked about System 1. And he suggested that System 1 may be the way that we can most effectively influence people's beliefs in the realm of science. Uh, Emily Moyer Gouzet has developed a model she calls the Entertainment Overcoming Resistance Model. The idea here is that in entertainment programming, people are less likely to believe that they are being overtly persuaded. Re so their guard is down. They're not engaging in reactance. They're not saying, hey, back off. I don't want you telling me what to think. Meanwhile, their involvement in the characters, in the storylines, the the sense of sort of having a relationship with these people who enter their homes each week, who they care about, that may be a setting in which, if there are certain messages embedded in entertainment programs, may be much more influential in persuading people, especially if they have sort of pre-existing beliefs that would be inconsistent with the message. And so, Although there was a question raised by an audience member last night as well about the ethics of this. I'm going to leave the ethics aside. You can judge the ethics for yourself. But there is certainly evidence and a strong move toward this notion that entertainment uh, programming may be very influential as a form of science communication. Um, similarly, researchers up here on our panel have done research on what's called the cultivation process which is the sense that just the overall message that you get from television can lead people to believe that the real world is like the television world. So for instance, when we see characters who are working in the forensic science labs doing DNA testing like overnight, and they seem like really cool people and they're having fun and they got tattoos and stuff like that, that that might make us think that that's a 
the way science happens, and that would be a really great career. Okay, so mass media have both sort of program-specific effects, but also system-wide effects. Um, I'm going to skip this one because I'm running out of time. So when I was working with my graduate student collaborator, um, Katie Cooper, on this talk, she said, so is that where you're going to end it? Because um, I didn't have a slide after the last one I showed you. And I said, yeah, I'm not sure. And she said, well, wouldn't you like to sum it up somehow? And I said, yeah, I would, but I'm not quite sure how to sum all that up. I said, do you have any suggestions? She said, well, you could say, it depends. <laughs> and I said, you're not going to be there. You get up there and say, it depends. I'll get pelted with tomatoes if that's what I do. Um, and so let me briefly try to summarize all the theories and models that I've just described to you, how we can put them together. First, we have a process of selectivity that's going on here. People's pre-existing values uh, and attitudes, like their political ideology, their socioeconomic status, their age, their education level, their income level, and their innate motivations, their employment, their interest, all of these things drive their choices regarding media exposure to how many forms, to what forms, to how much. Then there is a question of media effects. And media do have effects on people's beliefs, on people's knowledge. Okay? Sometimes beliefs we think of positive, or effects positive, effects negative. We also have to understand that people's background characteristics affect other things, like their likelihood to counter-argue a message, like their mental elaboration on ideas, like the extent to which they're going to engage in discussion of topics that aren't directly maybe necessarily related to media exposure, but that play an important, and this is for Katie, it depends. That is, the extent of your discussion may affect the effects of media exposure. The degree to which you engage in cog cognitive elaboration may affect the extent to which media exposure has an influence. The extent to which you counter-argue may affect the extent to which your media exposure has an influence. And then finally, <laughs> feedback. It's not a simple one-shot deal. This happens over time. The factual knowledge you gain, the beliefs that you develop from mass media exposure are going to feed back into your motivations. They're going to feed back into your media exposure. They're going to feed back into your discussions. And the process starts all over again. So, it is kind of complex. It does depend a lot, but we're making a lot of progress on understanding it by looking at bits and pieces. Thank you very much.